15 years, Japan had been building Greater East Asia. Her consecrated armies swept through Manchuria, East China, and French Indochina with fire and sword, looting, sacking, and pillaging. But to the south lay the real treasure, the East Indies with their oil, their tin, their rubber. England, France, and Holland were all engaged far on the other side of the globe. The Japanese had little to fear from them. In treacherous defiance of treaties, he had already fortified the mandates to the east. With the riches of the Indies in his hands, he could stand like a colossus across the ocean trade routes of the Orient. The only power the Japanese aggressor had to fear was an opposing sea power. He dealt with it, Japanese style. Hawaii. Midway, Wake, Guam, the Philippines. With our fleet immobilized, the Japs seized control of the Pacific, an island empire of 17 million square miles. We learned a bitter lesson. An isolated garrison thousands of miles from the base of supply is capable of only static resistance. Unsupported by sea power, such an outpost is a tragic liability. Within a few months, the Jap held unchallenged control of this vast ocean area. Around its edges and throughout its interior, he had constructed a web of interlocking fortified bases. To drive through this network, we must first push forward our sea control, taking bases as we went. For the sea was the only avenue of approach, and only with command of the sea could we advance our air and land power into position to strike at the homeland. But first we had to build a fleet, a mobile striking force strong enough to overcome anything the Jap might throw in our way. We had to build a fleet, a new navy, based on carriers and fast battleships already developed in peacetime. And to support them, we had to build oilers, ammunition ships, supply ships, repair ships, floating dry docks, the vast service forces to give the striking force logistical mobility. But the Jap was still in command of the sea. He could strike anywhere, anytime. We could only guess where and try to be there with something to stop him. In May, he attempted an amphibious advance on southern New Guinea. We checked him at the Coral Sea. In June, he tried to invade Midway. We checked him again. By July, he was completing a base on Guadalcanal, preparing to cut our supply route to Australia. We couldn't wait for ships that were building or troops that were training. We must stop him with what we had there and then. August 7th, 
1942, we landed Marines on Guadalcanal. We surprised the Jap, and the landings were easy. But we were just in time. In another two days, Jap planes would have been operating from Henderson Field, and the landing that had been so easy would have been well nigh impossible. But the Jap wanted Guadalcanal and strove desperately to take it back. duels and in furious close-range night actions, our Navy slugged it out with his. Our forces were numerically inferior, but we hung on. Little by little, we chopped away at his ships until by the end of the year we had gained command of the sea approaches to the southern Solomons. In 1943, the Marines were relieved by the Army. Our victory had decisively stopped the enemy advance, throwing him from offense to defense. We had reversed the wartime strategy of the Japanese Empire. Now, with our superior naval strength, we became mobile. Our courage at sea and our industrial skill at home had tipped the balance of sea power. From now on, the Jap would have to fight for what he had. February 1943. We made an amphibious assault on the Russells. June, New Guinea and Rendova. July, New Georgia. August, Eastern New Georgia. October, Choisel. November, Bougainville. The early phase of our island hopping advance was slow. We still lacked the carrier strength to support long overwater advances. While we waited for carriers, we had to use islands. An island airstrip may be unsinkable, but unlike a carrier, it cannot be moved. In close support of an amphibious advance, the range of aircraft is about 150 miles. For longer jumps, we needed more seaborne air power, more carriers, more mobility. Meanwhile, our northern Pacific forces had ousted the Japs from the Aleutians. Both our northern and southern flanks were secure. Now, through the central Pacific, we advanced to Tarawa. From Tarawa, we advanced to the core of the Marshall Islands defenses, taking Kwajalein and Eniwetok. From these operations emerged the pattern that was to dominate the Pacific War, the pattern of amphibious assault, the overwater advance of the foot soldier. For it is the foot soldier who seizes and holds ground. These are his weapons. They roll on wheels and on tracks. They are land weapons. But the infantryman's longest advances with these weapons are made over water. Sea power puts him where he can go to work. Command of the sea determines where the land war will be fought. The naval attack force transports, protects, and lands the infantryman and his equipment. On the way to the new front line, the foot soldier and all his fighting strength are bottled up in ships, helpless against enemy attack. Destroyers of the attack force protect him from submarines. Planes from escort carriers patrol the surrounding seas and shield him from enemy bombers. Later on D-Day and afterward, planes operating from these floating airfields will give him close air support staying until airfields have been built 
and shore-based planes brought in. Battleships and cruisers will serve as heavy artillery for the troops, clearing the beach and smashing fortified shore positions. Days before the infantryman hits the beach, the spearhead of this overwater expedition goes into action, hundreds of miles ahead of the objective. This is the naval covering force. Fast carriers, fast battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Carrier planes and battleship guns furnish the striking power to take and maintain command of the sea and air. Carrier planes beat down enemy air strength on distant fields, sink supply and troop ships, spiking possible reinforcement attempts. Before the landing, the covering force thrusts deep into enemy waters to smash any attempted interference by the enemy's fleet. This force is G.I. Joe's insurance that the enemy he meets on the beach will get no help from home. The function of sea power in the overseas advance becomes clear on the day of attack. Battleship, cruiser and destroyer guns pound the enemy's defenses. Planes from the floating airfields bomb and strafe defensive positions. Rocket ships plaster the beach. Minesweepers clear the way. Underwater demolition teams blow up beach obstacles. Attack transports also are fighting ships. Their projectiles, boatloads of troops. to work, and the fleet that brought him here will stay and support him until he wins the final decision. This is the pattern of amphibious assault. To put one foot soldier and his weapons ashore has required the fighting power of three men of the Navy. By the overwater advance into the Gilberts and Marshalls, we had extended our sea control by 1,200 miles, 1,200 miles closer to Japan. And the Japanese, failing to contest our advance with their fleet, had conceded command of the mid-Pacific. They had forgotten that the static defenses of island bases, no matter how strong, must be protected by the mobile striking power of a fleet. Without sea power, the unsinkable carrier alone could not command the sea. The Jap realized that a fleet requires bases, but he forgot that bases require a fleet. Meanwhile, we had cleaned up the central Solomons and were slowly advancing along the coast of New Guinea. Now, with adequate carrier forces available for support, we could make a long amphibious jump from Ley to Hollandia, bypassing 50,000 Jap troops. Without naval air power, this long advance could not have been made. The fast carrier task force provided the sea and air striking power to command the sea approaches to the objective. 
The jeep carriers of the attack force, functioning as floating airfields, provided the close air support that up until now had been limited by the short range of our island-based planes. Again, the pattern of amphibious advance, of sea power enabling the overwater advance of troops, determining the point of attack. The Jap wondered where we would strike next. The Marianas, Tinian, Saipan, Guam, were one bet. Truck was another. For years, the Jap had been fortifying truck. Guns, troops, airfields, planes, defenses of all kinds. A chain of airfields linked truck with the homeland. But most important, truck was a primary naval operating and repair base. With the main strength of the Japanese fleet protecting it, truck was the key bastion of the empire, commanding the approaches to the homeland. With land-based airstrikes from Enoetok and the Admiralties, and with naval guns and planes, we harassed the Jap. Too precious to risk in combat, his fleet withdrew, leaving Truck with static defenses alone. No longer a base, Truck was now only an island, only a rock in the middle of the ocean highway. Unless we tried to assault it directly, Truck could not even hurt us. Now, there was no need to invade. As a base for future operations, the Marianas would be just as useful. Our weight of sea power gave us the choice. We chose the Marianas. On June 11, 1944, the attack forces appeared off Saipan and went to work. The Jap was ready for us. It was tough going. The gunfire support ships had their hands full, supplying called fire for the assault troops. Then, when the going was hottest, came the report that the Japanese fleet was coming out and in heavy strength. For the first time, it appeared that the Jap would employ the only effective means of halting our advance to defeat our fleet and smash the amphibious forces engaged in the landing assault. But the Jap was still unwilling to risk his ships in a showdown fight. Instead, he launched an airstrike from extreme range, intending to bomb our fleet and land on the airfields of the beleaguered Marianas. Here, he would refuel, rearm, and complete the round trip, bombing our fleet again on the return run. They expected to find us entangled in shore operations, with our fighters still on the carrier decks. They got an unpleasant surprise. Our fighters met them far out at sea. Japs broke through our fighters, and 12 of those were shot down by our ships. But not all the Japs tried to come through. Some of the group sheared around the fleet and headed directly for the Marianas airfields. But only one field remained in Jap hands, Maroti. Our bombers and torpedo squadrons paved the way for them. We got 402 Jap planes that day, wiping out the air groups of the entire Japanese fleet. The next day, the planes of Task Force 58 returned to call. The retiring Japanese fleet went home, minus two carriers, two destroyers, and a tanker and with 11 cripples in tow. The infantry could proceed with their business without fear of further interruption. By August, all organized resistance had ceased. The Marianas were ours. 
we had gained in Guam the basis to support further operations throughout the far Pacific. We had the sea power to keep open its communications with the mainland. We had gained the shore facilities from which to mount further amphibious advances toward the Japanese Empire. And we had gained the air bases from which B-29s could smash at Japan itself. of our overwater advance continued to mount. Palau completed the isolation of truck. Morotai protected our flank as we advanced toward the Philippines. But somewhere to the west and north lurked the Japanese fleet. It could challenge our invasion armada converging on Leyte. Japanese sea power was not on hand to oppose our landings. But while we were most vulnerable, the Japanese fleet closed in from three sides. The Jap finally saw that only a decisive victory over our fleet could stop the overwater advances that were rapidly driving him back from his stolen empire. But we were ready for him. Three days of sea and air battle, the mangled Japanese fleet dragged itself away with a broken back. Never again would it contest our control of the seas. The Jap fleet, as a mobile striking force, was eliminated. But the Japanese still had one great defensive weapon. He had air power based on an interlocking network of airfields, concentrated most heavily on the southern home islands. From here on in, our fleet would come under the diving fire of the whole Imperial Air Force. Iwo Jima and Okinawa were outposts, flanking the approaches to the home islands. In February of 1945, we launched an amphibious assault on Iwo Jima, securing a fighter base to support the long-range bombing of Japan. we landed on Okinawa. As our troops advanced across the island, the Japs fought back from caves and hillside tombs, from pillboxes and fortified towns. The infantry had to have support from heavy naval guns, cover from ship-borne aircraft. Stay. To drive us out of Okinawa, the Japanese had to drive away our fleet. Without sea power, his only hope was to do it from the air. From the islands of their birth came the Japanese pilots on their last mission.
This was land-based air power in its deadliest form. But we stayed and fought it out. While we fought them off, we delivered 33,000 tons of shells, 50,000 tons of bombs and rockets into the island defenses. We flew 20,000 sorties from our carriers in close support of the ground troops. With Okinawa secured, we now held a great triangle of bases a forward anchor for our armed might, and a springboard for future operations. From these bases, the guns of the fleet could close to the very shores of Japan. From these bases, our shore-based air power could hammer the cities of the homeland. And from these bases, we could apply the atomic bomb at the instant of its development, hastening the end of the war. was a struggle for sea power, the greatest naval war in history. Only the mobile striking power of a fleet with its seaborne air and gun power can command the sea. Only a fleet could have stopped us, a fleet superior to our own. Guadalcanal, Kwajalein, the Marianas, the Philippines took them all. Static defenses, no matter how strong, are impotent without control of their sea approaches. The Pacific was the arena, 